All right, ready for a road trip? God, I hope so. What I wanted to talk to you about was uh, the the jail I did work at was a uh, pretty messed up place. Uh, and I've been in corrections for about over 10 years now. And uh, I spent about three and a half to four of those years at that facility. Uh you know, before that, I I had just graduated college with a you know a bachelor's in criminal justice, and I used to actually want to be a police officer. You know, I spent a whole year applying to these different departments. I was testing for them, and I just kept getting rejected. You know, I could do the physical tests fine. I could pass a lie detector. Uh, interviews were the things I I struggled at because uh, I guess I seemed unempathetic and disingenuous. Uh, I'd say things that, yeah, I thought they wanted to hear because I wanted a job. Mm -hmm. uh, being a police officer was was pretty much all I wanted to do as a kid, and it's been a year fresh out of college, trying and failing at these interviews. So to support myself, I started working graveyard shift at this gas station, and uh, being a college educated gas station clerk just made me feel like the world's biggest failure of a human being. I was watching my friends go off and work for these big companies or get into master's programs or law school. They were getting married. Uh, and I'm just here at a freaking quick shop at two in the morning, smiling at drunk people and fighting off the advances of the drunk chick that would come in wasted and depressed. She didn't catch anything in her Venus flytrap at the bar that night. Mm. Uh, there was, a, there was a cop that I, I became friends with. He'd come into the store, and he floats the idea to me that I should get some experience working in corrections. You know, you know, pad out that resume of mine, get used to their law enforcement mentality, you know, help me out in the interviews. I thought it was a good idea, you know, on paper. I was really apprehensive because, uh, uh, well, I mean, I knew of what jails and prisons were like from sitting in a classroom and having professors tell me or guest speakers, you know, I'd never actually been there, uh, you know, apart from, you know, what I used to watch on Locked Up or Scared Straight. Yeah. Uh, but I, uh, after about a year working at the gas station, I got super depressed and uh, I was at the point where I began having suicidal thoughts, just kind of just being so stagnant. So I went ahead and I found a jail in a city around some of where my friends moved to, and I applied. And they pretty much handed me the job that same day. And in retrospect, that should have been a huge red flag. Okay, uh, I wasn't really formally trained until I had already been doing the job for about six months. And if that sounds super messed up to you, congrats! You are, are so much smarter than everybody else who is running that county. Uh, what, what passed for training was me being taught by a sergeant who oversaw me. Uh, just just while well, I was on my probationary period and he was running one of the jails of this floor. The jail has about eight floors. There's different inmates on these floors, uh, depending on, you know, what they call a LSI score, which kind of, it's ranked from various things like what you're charged with, what you're aged with, how long you've been in the system, you know, stuff like that. Uh, I was on the fourth floor and those are guys who are about 25 to 50 years old who are ev there from everything from drugs to murder. Uh, the person they had training me was a Nigerian immigrant who I couldn't understand very well a lot of the time. And he would get really pissed off and frustrated that I, I was having to have him repeat stuff to me. And he would berate me. I'd get called stupid a lot. Uh, he'd threaten to uh, issue me formal discipline for things that I either did or didn't do. Uh, and he's just this really intimidating guy who yelled at me a lot. And weirdly enough, that actually 
help me do the job a little better if I was more afraid of what he might do than, you know, going into a housing unit of 30 to 40 inmates, you know, as this 23-year-old kid uh, to check up on their well-being and make sure nobody was doing anything too, you know, overtly bad. Um, I once watched that same sergeant uh, snatch up this inmate by his dreadlocks and slam his head repeatedly into the floor. And the only reason he stopped was because his dreads fell out of his scalp. Oh my God. Yeah. So when I say that, that this guy made my life hell, you know, that's, that's who I was dealing with. Uh, saw, I saw a lot of things there like that. I, uh, I was involved in a lot of stuff. I found a I found a group of coworkers that I clicked with really well. They helped me get through a lot. We, uh, you know, we had each other's backs. We we'd hang out outside the job sometimes. It just kind of made like the the stuff you're dealing with every day just that much easier when you know you got somebody who's gonna, you know, jump in there with you or for you, and, or knows that you're gonna do the same thing for them. And they become really important when you spend, you know, all day around pissed off inmates who, you know, they call you every name in the book, threaten you, try to manipulate you, yada, yada, you know, or when you're being drafted to work another eight hours for the second or third time that week, because, you know, they can't hire people to fill the vacancies. You know, you might work 16 hour days back to back with no choice in the matter. You know, even if you have no idea how to run the area that you're being assigned to on your overtime, you know, you haven't, you know, nobody's ever trained you there before, but you know, too bad you're there now. That's where they need you to be. You know, I, I, my first, my first time overseeing a pod, uh, was on an overtime shift during my first six months. And that pod was where they put atypical inmates. Have you heard that word before? No. Uh, that's the word that they use to refer to LGBTQ plus people. You know, they use the uh, word I guess atypical. I get there. Yeah, they use the word atypical. What the hell? Like, why can't you just? I I I know. It's a it's kind of a messed up, all encompassing word for anybody who's not a you know straight cisgendered person. Mm-hmm. Uh. Yeah, they those those guys had it way rougher than uh well on on some aspects they had it way rougher than like somebody who was uh a non-atypical inmate there so anyway i get to this pod and i see the i see the old corrections officer packing up his stuff and he's leaving without telling me anything uh that i needed to be doing that night i stop him at the door and i ask him you know what what the hell should i do here and his words just walk around and if you see them having sex with each other separate them and i was like what is, how okay first of all how am i supposed to do that like are you giving me this like like a spray bottle they used to discipline cats and go tss, no tss, tss, no get that dick out of your mouth tss, no tss, stop Jesus. like yeah that's like, oh my god like, ugh. so I got I got assigned to a different floor after about seven or eight months, and I got transferred to the second floor. That's the floor they kept all the high risk inmates who were in like twenty three hour lockdown for extreme and unpredictable behavior. Uh, it's where they kept the psychiatric inmates. It's where they kept the ones with physical disabilities or like. Uh, limitations or really bad diabetes uh, that's where they kept the nurses station and the medical housing cells where people would go and detox under camera observation 24 hours a day or if you were suicidal uh, we, we even had like this small little housing unit just for the kids under 17 who were ch like charged with like being charged as an adult like child murderers mm. we had one kid who was there because he like he shot a guy and then tried disposing of the body in a dumpster and he was one of the nicest 
inmates I had ever met, and, I, and it was always a joy to talk to him, even like knowing like why he was there. Uh, you know, you kind of forget about it sometimes. Right. I, I hope he's doing okay. Wherever he is. And uh, give you a little more context about how like nuts the job can be. I, I remember like this one fight we had to break up between these two guys. And, you know, you might imagine, you know, officers separating inmates from fighting. You know, you pull out the tasers and the pepper spray and you just hit them with the stuff and they go down quick. No, no, we didn't have any of that stuff. No, the administration had such little faith in us that they figured anything they give us, an inmate will take from us and they'll use on other staff members. So instead of doing that, instead of giving us anything useful or training us uh, to keep us ready, they just didn't give you anything but a radio and a pair of handcuffs to use. And that was it. And I didn't even get trained to use those things until after about six months. Uh, so basically what your tactic is when, when inmates fight is to just wait for enough backup and then dogpile them uh, like zookeepers trying to restrain an alligator if you've ever seen those videos yep that's basically what the same thing is you have to gator wrestle the murderers uh, <laughs> gator wrestle the murderers jesus christ well, so so we 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 gator wrestle them apart and the first guy like we ask him okay so why are you guys fighting the first guy he doesn't want to say anything like he says not a damn word the second guy though he w <laughs> wanted to tell us what the hell happened okay so i guess these two guys had agreed to okay if you can't use the word uh they had agreed to happy mouth time each other oh uh, <laughs> And after the first guy gets his, he backs out of the deal. You know, real dick move. So, don't do that, so, dude. Courses, yeah, no. If if you if if you're gonna agree to something, see it through to the end, there, guy. Yeah. Uh, so uh, understandably, the second guy's pissed, and that's when the fight starts. You know, barter economy at work for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was like my like one of my first moments. Like, oh, I'm Toto. We are not in Kansas anymore. Uh, had this other guy who was really hard to interact with due to how just how schizophrenic he was. Uh, did do you remember the uh, the Geico commercials where they have the cavemen and they're just sitting there talking? Yeah. Like how what they look like. Th this guy looked like one of the Geico cavemen. That was just his physical appearance. Uh, and he would scream and rant at us about how he was both the son of God and how he had adamantium bones and claws. Okay, he'd be ranting at me like that one day, and I'm like, okay, dude, you can't be Jesus and Wolverine. If, if the Bible was an X-Man comic, I would have read it. You need to pick one. <laughs> Uh, and and other and other inmates would rile him up by playing into this stuff, like like playing to his mental illness to get him to break stuff or try to hit us. So we'd have to put him in bunk restraints. And bunk restraints are when you are chained to the bed in the least fun way possible. Like every two hours, we had to let him up to use the bathroom and have him medically assessed, so it wasn't inmate abuse to do this. Or at least Jesus. that's what it looks like, you know, on camera that you're letting somebody up to use the bathroom and have a nurse check on them. What that really does is that gets it so your body never gets used to being in the prone position. So it makes it that much more uncomfortable. Are they allowed to sleep for uh, long periods of time? Yeah. Yeah, but we still have to wake him up every two hours to check on him. Oh, my God. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't wait to use the bathroom. He, he'd just go on himself. Mm -hmm. And so whenever we stood him up, this just waterfall of... And since he was doing that, the lieutenants decided to just keep him in restraints uh, instead of letting him up because he was calmed down. Now, like, oh, he shit himself? All right, keep him in restraints. That'll teach him a lesson. What that never did, because he'd just do it again and again because he's too damn crazy to to 
you know, connect those dots. So he would be in bunk restraints for days until people just got sick of it and let him up until, you know, he'd explode again. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, for all those inmates that, you know, fight over BJs or claim they're Jesus, the worst people in the jail, a lot of the time were your coworkers. The people that you you depend on to help you. You know, when I started, I made eleven thirty three an hour, and I took the job because I thought that's how I'd become a police officer. You know, other people took the job because they literally had no other prospects, and they hired anyone. People who could barely write a coherent sentence. People who had relatives incarcerated in the jail. I have no idea why anyone found it acceptable to entrust the safety and security of many of these people to, to, to these, these idiots they would hire. Or these like clearly corrupt people who has like aunts, uncles, dads, brothers, sisters locked up there. And if you didn't, and you didn't pay them enough to take care of themselves, and, and you didn't train them well enough, so a lot of these people would find other ways to support themselves. If you're not, if you're not getting hired at a jail with a clear intent to smuggle in contraband, here's how that ends up happening: can't make rent because you know you get paid complete dog shit. Well, inmates, they'll, they'll pay you 30 to 50 bucks per pack of cigarettes you bring them. And as soon as you do that, though, they got you. You do that a few times, then they won't take cigarettes. Then they're going to want weed. If you say no, they're going to tell your superior that you brought them the cigarettes, and then you're fired. So then you bring them the weed, and you make hundreds of dollars each time you do it. Then eventually it's coke, meth, heroin. If you're a female staff member, they're not going to want the drugs after that. They're just going to want you. And if they get bored of you, they'll sell you to another inmate. I could look up about 15 different news articles for you right now about officers at this one jail who got busted doing this. These are the on only the ones that got caught, though. Mm. Then there are the then there are there are male staff members who. I, get it in their head that it's a good idea to have sex with female inmates that they kept up on floor six. Even one of the lieutenants did that. He'd go into this one girl's cell every night for Bible study. That's when, that, well, that, that's, 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 I mean, that's what he told the investigation board <laughs> when they brought him up on, you know, are, are, like, are you abusing this inmate? Like, no, I'm just going into her so for Bible study, like, yeah, nobody believes that, dude. So they gave him the option to quit or be fired. They didn't fire him he on the spot? He should have been put in prison. No, no. I guess he had too many, he'd been there too long, had too many friends, or they, I guess, or they might not have had enough actual evidence to say that he was doing what he was clearly doing. But they gave him an option to quit or be fired. He should have just been thrown in prison. Yeah. Uh, because because inmates cannot legally consent. Uh, if you if you're doing that, that's a sex crime. You're a sex offender. These people cannot consent legally. There's this thing called PREA, which is it stands for the Prison Rape Elimination Act. It was passed sometime during the Bush administration. Uh, it's like a set of policies and stuff that staff need to be doing to make sure that these things happen the least amount of times as possible and all the inmates have a good safe way to report abuse to us so we can get them help and medical attention and stop this from happening not once was anyone i worked with there trained on prea policies not once i didn't get to know about it until i finally got out of there and i you know started working at a place where you know people are sane another worst god these guys 
worst staff members are the ones who think they're tough. These are the guys who instigate fights with inmates, and they expect you to jump in there with them, all because you're wearing the same uniform they are. Even if you know it's wrong, and you do it, you do it because you might need them one day. And if you don't, you're a target by your coworkers, even your bosses, and supervisors. Yeah, they weren't they weren't clean either. I was uh, I was doing this shakedown of a housing unit, and that's where uh, that's where you thoroughly search an area. And you know you got several staff members present, and they're supervised by a lieutenant. And all the inmates who live there, if you're searching a housing unit, get strip searched. And their cells get tossed. One of the younger inmates, uh, he wanted to run his mouth the entire time, and he wanted to flash gang signs at staff and lieutenant. And lieutenant got a few of us uh, to go into his cell with him and the inmate, uh, put him in handcuffs. I thought we were just taking him to a holding cell to where he can be alone for a little bit. You know, sometimes you take uh, take one inmate away from his friends so, and he doesn't have anybody to act tough for anymore, so he calms down. And I thought that's what was going on. And Lieutenant starts screaming in this guy's face, telling him to either swing on him or cuff up. And the kid cuffs up. You know, I guess he thought he wouldn't get hit that way. And he was wrong. Uh, as soon as the lieutenant cuffs him up, he says to him, you should have swung. And then he headbutts him just about as hard as I've ever seen anybody do. And he smacks him around a few more times and he puts him on the floor. He's twisting his ear as he's screaming into it the entire time. And I'm just standing there just shocked. And I didn't know what to do. So I did nothing. I let it happen. We all did. You you tell yourself he deserves it. You know, since the kid doesn't need to go to the hospital, you tell yourself that it wasn't uh, it wasn't a big deal. You know, that kid went from you know cocky son of a bitch to apologetic. So you tell yourself that's just what needed to happen. You know, by by next week, the kid was back to doing the same stuff as he was before. It didn't actually change anything. You tell yourself it's necessary anyway. And is if you think anything else, you're going to betray your coworkers. You do that next time. It could be you. You know, you you lie to yourself to keep yourself safe, and you lie to yourself because you you're living paycheck to paycheck. And if you have to spend a month looking for a new job, you might be homeless. And you lie to yourself to keep yourself from being fired. And uh, and there goes your chances of being a police officer, if you have that on the record. And, and none of those excuses make it right. And I, I told myself that I was going to be fine because I never put hands on an inmate who wasn't actively fighting me, and I never struck one. I only ever restrained him. That was something that other people did, and, and as long as that's not me, I'm good. That's how I survived. And I saw stuff like this all the time. It's just one example. I... Uh, I kept my head down over the next couple of years. I played along without doing anything bad myself, and and I got burnt out. I still couldn't find a job anywhere. Being a police officer, I'd go home to my crappy apartment every day. And I'd, I'd be depressed. And uh, one day, I'm I'm working transportation, helping process our releases. And he said, so so during the day. Some inmates would be at court, and if court let them out, they would still come back to jail to be processed out. 
some of them would get released to the street. You know, some of them had warrants at uh, other jurisdictions. One guy had been a holding cell since the start of my shift. Uh, he waited for about five hours for the for the call to come down that his paperwork's done and that he can go. And I didn't get that call. I was working with a, the guy I trusted and I liked a lot, and I'm going to call him Sean. This, uh, this inmate starts pounding on a cell door just out of nowhere, demanding that he be let go. And I talk to him. I tell him I'm going to talk to the records department, uh, see what's going on. And he calms down for the moment. And then I, uh, I go talk to records people and they tell me this guy should never have been brought down to my holding cell because he's got a felony warrant out of a place two states away and i'm like oh shit so i tell sean what records just told told me i said okay we need to be ready because this guy's gonna be pissed and uh him and i go over to the cell open it up and I tell him, all right, guy, I gotta gotta send you back upstairs to your cell because it's gonna take uh, this place a couple weeks to get here for you. And he starts going ballistic, starts screaming like, what, what, what do you mean? I gotta think. And he starts walking up on me with this look in his eye that I am very familiar with at this point, and I know that he now wants to fight us. And I get my hands up, and I'm looking at him coming towards me. And I start realizing how much like my father this guy looks like. I'm not going to get into it a whole lot, but my father was not a good person. He, uh, he was a violent alcoholic who terrorized my family. And now his doppelganger is staring at me in the face, walking up on me, wanting to throw hands. I, I tell him, if you want to go talk to the records people yourself, I'm more than willing to let you do that. And then he, he agrees to that and get, puts his hands back down. And I call over the, the sergeant of that area. And he's, he's a good dude. He's, uh, he's, he's one of those big uh, half Samoan, half black guys, you know, 350 plus pound guys, you know, really nice guy. And I know that he can handle himself, and I know Sean can handle himself. And they take him back over to records. His, uh, the local police department showed up to, to pick up somebody else, so I start helping them with that. And I, I, th I saw that as my out for the moment, because I didn't want to keep dealing with this guy, because he just reminded me way too much of my dad. And I'm helping local PD out. And I'm trying to find the paperwork for their for their guy, and I come across that first guy's file, the one that the one Sean's with, and I see domestic violence after domestic violence after domestic violence charge, and I get angry, and I'm staring at it when this really loud bang happens behind me. Uh, there's a wall separating my workstation from where the, the dress-out windows are, where they, t they get their stuff back from records before they're released. There's a, there's a chair that had gotten thrown to the, you know, the viewing glass, so I jump up and I rush over there, and I'm waiting for the door to be popped by master control station, because it's all, those doors are electronically controlled by somebody and a different part of the jail and I'm, and I'm waiting there and like seconds turn into minutes and I want to puke and the door pops and I rush in there and they're all scrambling on the floor and and Sean's eye is closed and there's blood being smeared everywhere and I and I, and I jump on this guy and he's he's screaming at us and I, I, I get one of the cuffs on his right arm and he starts he starts screaming, stop hitting me, I'm not a bad guy, and I yell, quit fucking acting like it. And I, I, they're all still fighting each other and I wrench the arm that I've cuffed behind him over to the other one and I get that secured 
and I raise up my my I raise up my arm, and I want to hit him. I want to hit him so bad, and I and I and I can't. I can't, I can't, I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it. He's still begging for us to stop. And, and, and my two guys, they're still going at it, and they don't know he's coughed. So, I, 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 I tap my, my sergeant on the shoulder, and I tell him to stop. And he does. And Sean stops. That's uh, that's when the emergency response team gets there, and they take over. The fucking cops were behind me the entire time, making jokes about how how we don't play around here. You know, nobody would have stopped me. Nobody would have cared. The feeling just starts leaving. And the lieutenant comes over, sees if we're okay. Just Sean just took one in the eye, and he's fine. It's, none of that blood is his. And lieutenant just kind of starts, starts sniffing the air, uh, and that's when I notice it too. And he looks at us and he says, Did that guy shit himself. And, uh, we say, uh, yeah, I, I think he did. And then he, he whispers to us, good job. And at that time, yeah, I thought that was really funny. And uh, now I know it's sad. I, uh, I didn't know how to make sense of any of that. You know, you know why, why didn't I hit him? It felt wrong not to hit him. It felt like I wasn't man enough to make him pay for hitting Sean or to make him pay for whoever it was that he abused before jail. And I, I know that I did the right thing by restraining him and stopping my coworkers from, from beating a man who's in restraints. I, I know what I did was right and I did what anybody should have done, but it, it felt wrong. Like I, I still somehow failed because I did that. My moral compass had become so broken at that point that what was right felt wrong. I saw, uh, I started feeling suicidal again. Uh, I felt absolutely trapped working in that place, not finding a way out, feeling broken, not knowing who I was anymore. And I told a coworker that I was struggling and they told my, my supervisors and, and their response was to make sure I didn't work any post that required to have a firearm. That was it. There was no sending me to a hospital. There was no sending me home. There was no making sure I followed up with my promise to see a counselor. The only thing they cared about was whether or not I killed myself with their guns at work. So, like, they didn't have to be responsible somehow. They didn't care if I lived. Uh, during that time, uh, they just have me supervise housing pods. I remember having a really long day in a pod, and I'm walking down the hallway, get to the elevator, go clock out. I hear my name being called over the facility intercom, saying I needed to go to the second floor. And when you get told that, that means that you're escorting an inmate to a hospital which sucks, you know, you oftentimes you're just by yourself making sure one guy doesn't, you know, get out of his restraints or, you know, runs or assaults anybody or anybody does anything to him. And most of these, most of the time it's guys who, you know, fake chest pain so they can go somewhere else for a while. 
and I saw it as a you know mostly pointless pain in the ass, and I'm pissed that I I now think I'm going to be working a whole nother shift because somebody else has cabin fever. And I get on the elevator. I got two of my coworkers there, and I'm and I'm bitching to them that I'm being sent to the hospital, and they tell me the guy they're sending me on to watch might actually die. My response? Oh, he better be dying. One of them punches me. He didn't do that because I was being disrespectful to an inmate having a medical emergency. He did that because he was afraid of what was going to happen to him because he was present when the guy stopped breathing. And I, I, I get up there. There are so many people around this around this inmate. John. His, his name's John. John's uh, John's on the floor with uh, the heaviest male nurse we have on shift. Just just on top of him doing CPR, and he's doing chest compressions so violently that his sternum is damn near touching his spine. His eyes are open, and he's looking at me as I turn around the corner, and I had never seen anybody dead like that before but i knew i just i just knew somehow that there was nothing anybody was doing to bring him back it just wasn't going to happen i go over to my lieutenant and i ask him is there any point to me putting restraints on him when he gets escorted out and he just straight up says no just watch him until they call the time of death Everybody in the room had no delusions that anything that they were going to do was going to help. The reason that they were doing this was so that we can't, so that we are able to say that the inmate, that, that John didn't die at the jail for, you know, liability reasons. The fire department, EMT shows up, and they... They put him on the stretcher. Somebody's on top of him the entire time. I go with him. I'm I'm in the I'm in the big service elevator we have for this kind of stuff to take him down to the the garage where all the vehicles are, the Sally Port. And I I remember noticing then that John had voided his bowels, so all these chest compressions are doing is just pushing all of that gas and shit just out of him. It's not doing anything else. We get to the we get to the ER. Uh, wheel them in there, and the doctors try for about five ten minutes. They're doing CPR, they're defibrillator, needles, nothing. They're doing works. John just keeps flopping around lifelessly like this beanbag chair. Some kids jumping on. And uh, then they call it. John was legally dead. This this hospital chaplain comes over, and he and he starts asking me questions about John. You know what he what he believed in. I tell him I don't know. I I, I don't know anything. I had never interacted with him before. Now, you know he asks if I'd like to have anything said, and I'm I'm an atheist. I don't know and I, I tell him i have to go make some phone calls to get out of the conversation i call my boss i tell him send somebody you know, pick me up take me back to the jail he says it's going to be about 30 minutes so i go back in the er and a doctor has now led this team of new residents into the area to look at the dead guy he, uh, he asks if any of them would like to volunteer to try CPR on a dead man to get a feel for what it's going to be like for them. And one of them starts giving it a shot. You know, half an hour ago, John was a living person, and now he's a training dummy. And I thought that was so fucked up, and I, I start screaming at them to get off of him. And the doctor looks like he's just about to give me the business, and... At that moment, though, they wheel in this kid behind me. I'm still in the ER. My back's to the entrance. 
and the kid they wheel in had shot himself so his brain is exposed to the air and now they're going to go deal with that instead of you know scoff at me he was just there for DUI he was an alcoholic he had he'd never been in trouble with anything else he was just withdrawing from alcohol in a jail for three days and he died and he had a wife he had a daughter and he spent his last moment hallucinating throwing himself around a cell yelling at people who weren't there when he just, he just quit breathing while people were trying to restrain him keep him from hurting himself you know like they're supposed to for once I quit I quit trying to be a, a police officer I had this I had this really great friend of mine uh, he's able to find a new job and he was able to leave that jail and he told me but it was at this place just in the next state over at a, at a residential facility. And I never, I'd never heard of those before. And he said that it was just this world of difference working there, helping rehabilitate people, helping get them jobs and treatment, and that fights were rare and that the coworkers are way more professional. And it sounded like just this mythical promised land to me at that point. And I applied. And eventually I was hired. I remember I remember that morning I get the call. It was my weekend and I had just spent I had just spent this entire week working sixteen hour days back to back. And if I had refused to do that, I was gonna be suspended. And you know, there goes my clean work record. Uh so guy calls me up and he tells me that he wants me to start in two weeks, and I cannot tell you how happy I was to hear that. If you've if you've ever seen like old clips of the Maury show, I don't know if it's is that still on the air? Is it still on the air? I have no idea. But uh, okay, but th there was it was this daytime talk show where they would bring in couples for paternity tests, and a lot of the times, you know, the guy would deny he's the father, and they bring out the test results, and one of them would go fucking balls to the walls happy for being right, and a lot of these dudes would do this like touchdown dance. Like if, when they were proven to not be the father and I would watch this and I would think to myself that is the happiest I've ever seen a person act okay the most joy a person can ever experience is being told they aren't the father on daytime TV it's not it's not climbing Mount Everest or winning the Super Bowl it's being told that you're not going to be writing a third child support payment check every month I had finally felt that level of joy knowing I did not have to go back to that jail ever again. I was actually trained before I did the job. I was being spoken to without being insulted or cursed at. I wasn't yelled at, and it took a lot of time to get used to that. If, uh, if the, the guys I supervise now want to blow up they are free to leave if they want. I'm not going to stop them. The ones that are ordered to be there by the court, I just call the sheriff's department and they'll be picked up eventually. I now talk to people through whatever it is that's bothering them. And I was actually trained on verbal de-escalation and CRC. That stands for Cognitive Recognition Communication, which is a fancy way of saying to get them to think about their own behavior in an effort to gain compliance and hopefully change how they see things and act. A year in, I'm watching the news in the break room. John's daughter was being interviewed because she believed the jail was responsible for John's death. And I completely understood why she felt that way, given the jail's reputation, if, especially after, you know, some of those officers involved with restraining him when he quit breathing were later charged with inmate abuse and other incidents. You know, four of my old friends 
four of my old co-workers from that jail are now in prison because they decided to beat an inmate while he was in restraints. There is no doubt in my mind they did that. Two years after that, my, my old jail's on the news again. Had an ex-co-worker of mine who was nearly beaten to death by an inmate. He was he was in charge of this lockdown area that was used uh, that was it was originally intended to house low security inmates in a in an open pod area, but now you're using the that area to house 23 hour lo disciplinary lockdown. So this this one inmate comes for his time out of his cell, and he waited for that officer to not be paying attention and attacked him. And he hit him with everything he got his hands on that was around the day room. I couldn't tell you how long it took for anyone to come in and help him, but I do know that he was supervising that area alone. Uh, what I can tell you is that he would spend his Thanksgiving on a ventilator that year, nobody knowing if he was going to live or die. That guy, uh, he wasn't a friend of mine. I actually always thought that he was too trusting of inmates. Uh, he had a lackadaisical attitude a lot of times. I, already, I always told myself that he was not to be counted on in an emergency, and I told the supervisors about things that he did or didn't do that made me worried about other people's safety, and they never did anything. Uh, so I hear this, and I had had it. In my mind, did that administration probably now just cost a man his life with the way that they are running the jail. I call up a local news station. Uh, it's, it's been covering the story. I ask them if they want to talk to me about what I know under the, the condition that my name is not to be given out, nor is my face to be shown. As I, I, did not, I still did not trust the people at that county to not somehow get back at me uh, after I got done saying all these bad things about them. And I, and I go to this park to meet the reporter and her cameraman, and I tell them, uh, here, meet me under this gazebo uh, in the park. And they're like, cool, we'll, we'll be there. So I show up that day, I get to the gazebo, and, there, there's, and there's, a, there's a guy and a girl under the gazebo, uh, just on, totally on top of each other, making out and on a bench. And I go, uh, that's probably not them. And then I start seeing all these black cases that they had brought with them around, and I start going, oh, I really hope this isn't camera equipment. <laughs> and, then I get a, and then I get a phone call from the reporter, like, where the hell are you? And I'm like, oh, thank God, that's not them. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and, and I tell him like, it's like so, so you guys went to the wrong gazebo. The one that you should have gone to had this guy and girl making out underneath it. And I thought that was you. And she starts busting out laughing. <laughs> and uh, so I get to where they are. And they had actually picked a much nicer, you know, area. Because, you know, that's their professionals. <laughs> and uh, do the interview. And uh, I tell them about the officer who was attacked, and I tell them that the, the jail should never have used this area to house disciplinary lockdown. He should not have been alone. And I blame the county for not running the jail right, not staffing people, not caring about the problems till they blew up. And I wanted to tell them so much more. And I wanted to tell them about every single thing that had happened there. But they didn't have time to hear that. They wanted to stick to one story, and it aired, and it changed nothing. Mm. The only thing that happened was uh, they had everybody who was still working at that jail sign a new agreement saying that they wouldn't talk to the media. Uh, they believed that the person who talked was still working there. They actually thought it might be this other guy I worked with. And he told me that they were following him <laughs> oh, outside work to see if he'd have any more interviews. Isn't that illegal? Like on so many levels? Not only if you get caught, like all the other shit that they did. Jesus. But, uh, 
Yeah, so it's all I did was piss off people. They didn't change anything. Right now, what they're actually doing, they're looking at building a new jail for that county. Like, that's going to solve any of their problems. You know, although to do that, though, they have to kick everybody out of this trailer park so they can build it. And in that trailer park, there are veterans who live there. There are disabled people who live there. There are These are people who have literally nowhere else to go, but now they have to fuck off somewhere so that this county can build a new jail to look like they give a damn. The problem, the problem is that in, in, in that county is the same as in a lot of counties. Okay, they, they view their jails and correctional facilities as wastes of money. They only want to give them just enough for things to barely function. They don't want to pay staff enough where they can pick and choose who to hire so you don't get people smuggling drugs or beating people. You don't, they don't want to pay to make sure everyone has a partner looking out for them. You know, and why should they? You know, a lot of people think that jails and prisons are just fine the way they are. That the inmates that are there to be punished, right? That's what they're there for. They're just there to be punished. So what, what people don't understand is that punishment is vengeance. And vengeance doesn't solve the problem. It only perpetuates it. What people should do instead of spending money building new jails and prisons every year is use that money to rehabilitate more people. You get the security problem under control and then establish more methods of treatment. You know, make sure they can have jobs and opportunity when they get out. Make sure that where you send them back to aren't the same streets where they learn to survive on. You know, the streets where they did whatever it was they did to get locked up for. You know, it takes a lot more than what a jail and a prison can do alone to improve society. You need to make sure that where we live is a place everyone wants to be part of and succeed in. They don't do that in a lot of places. It because and and here's here's why they don't do it. It feels too good to punish people. They crave that catharsis. They feel when someone who commits crimes gets what's coming to them. I I know how intoxicating that is, and I've seen a lot of my friends fall prey to it. Until they get locked up too. And and you might, you know, somebody might say, okay, well, what if it was your loved one, you know, that was hurt or murdered? And I'd say, I'd probably want to find that person. I'd, I'd probably hurt them. You know, I'd, I'd torture them for about as long as I could. But what does that say about the argument, though? If I have to be just so overwhelmed with grief and emotionally compromised before I agree with it, mm. I'm, I'm telling you now that punishment is vengeance, and vengeance doesn't solve a thing. Okay, I, I now try to help people that I work with. I can give them encouragement. And I can tell them how well I think that they're doing, how much work I see them put into everything. I can help them get jobs. I can help them talk to their families. I can take them to treatment classes. I, I can get volunteers in to teach them things. I can get GED programs. I can, I can help them with their welding class. We had, uh, we had photography class. We even had a drama class in to help. <laughs> get people to do something else mm. and I and I saw I had I had some people come through my facility right now that I had as inmates at that other jail and I saw that Geico caveman again and now that he's 
on medication and he's going through treatment and he's got a job. He's keeping his mind together and he's doing so much well. He's a completely different person than, than the one that we had to tie to a bed to gain compliance. He just needed people to be human with him. That's, that's all he needed. That's all a lot of these guys needed. Mm. I uh, I asked somebody I work with now about what her experience was like when uh, she worked at some other places. You know, if she ever felt like I do. And uh, she told me about how uh, back in Puerto Rico, she was a cop and uh, she saw her fellow officers uh, handcuff a man behind his back and then throw him in a river. And she told me she knew if she said anything, she would be going into that river next. She told me that I, I really shouldn't be hard on myself because I did what I had to in order to live. I had a I had another coworker working a prison. And she saw her coworkers running drugs. And she did tell on them. And they beat her. They did way more too. I don't want to say what that was, uh, but she did. She still showed up at the, their trials, and she testified. And I always looked up to her, because that little old lady is stronger than I ever was to go through all that and still do the right thing. And sometimes I I think that maybe if 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 I help enough people, that, that it might make up for what I just I stood by and I let happen. Most <laughs> I know I'm getting myself. I know I can't. <sighs> I deserve. I deserve to be as alone as I am. Hey. Hey. Step out of the car with me. You don't deserve to be alone. You did the best you could. And you learned a lot from it. You are now working to help people. You deserve to feel good as much as any other person on this planet. You are not evil. You are not cruel. You are not subhuman. You are not inhuman. You're okay. Thanks. Come here. Thanks for listening to me. It's been a pleasure. Tell me a story, I want to hear it. You might think it's boring, but I'm interested.